Hello friends and welcome to Zionville. Big issues in Daniel 11. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our great God and our Heavenly Father, we do thank Thee for this opportunity once more to come before Thee to study Thy Word. Today, Daniel 11, a chapter which for the most part is very clear, but there are some differences in viewpoint when you get toward the end of it. So we pray you will be with me as I speak and will be with those listening. I will advance some solutions to this problem, I believe, and I pray people will listen to it with an open mind and study for themselves, that you may be glorified at last. We will wait on you to make these things totally clear to us. We thank thee in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Big Issues in Daniel 11. In our studies of the prophecies of Daniel last Monday and Thursday, first in chapters 2 and 7, and then in chapters 8 and 9, we have seen the literal fulfillments and the principle of repeat and enlarge in the rise and fall of the four great world empires and the rise of the papacy. We now come to the third installment. This study will be a look at Daniel 11. We will finish on Thursday with chapter 12. It's way too much for one study. Chapter 11 takes us from the Medo-Persian Empire all the way down to the feet and toes of the image and to the very verge of Armageddon. Everything is as clear as a bell with history as our guide, but there are significant issues towards the end of chapter 11. I have a solution for the impasse when we get to the later verses of this chapter, which seems to be a satisfying one, if indeed there is some merit to both views, those of Uriah Smith and James White. And I believe there is, as we shall see. But no prophecy unfulfilled, unless sanctioned by the spirit of prophecy, is absolutely written in stone. So we will just have to watch and see what develops. None of us can be dogmatic, nor should we be. We are certainly at the right time in history for their fulfillment, however. Things are moving in that direction on every front. The disputed section is verses 36 to 45, as we shall see later. So overall, chapter 11 is certainly very clear when looking back at fulfilled history as to what has transpired to our time. It is also very complete. It is a long chapter with much activity. Therefore, we are not going to be able to discuss all of these fulfillments here. So I will survey only a few of them to give you an idea. To survey all of it, one book you can look into is Daniel and the Revelation, 1897 edition by Uriah Smith. He does an excellent job. It can be procured at this web address. For the disputed matter, see the research report on the 11th chapter of Daniel, which takes the opposite view from Smith, James White's view, here at this web address. Write both of these resources down, these web addresses, and then you can, can compare them in depth side by side. Now to begin, let's look at a few of the historical fulfillments of the many in chapter 11. They are all quite strikingly fulfilled and prove so clearly the soundness of the Protestant historicist principle of prophetic interpretation. They are parallel to chapters 2 and 7 and 8 and 9 from Medo-Persia onward. Indeed, as we learned already, historicism was the angel Gabriel's method of prophetic interpretation long before the Protestants rose up and championed it. It is therefore God's method as opposed to Satan's and Rome's. To begin with, verse 1 tells us that the angel Gabriel, God is my strength, who appeared with Christ in Daniel's vision by the Hittichel in chapter 10, was sent at the beginning of Darius's reign in response to Daniel's prayers, his fasting, and his desire to understand. He was again the revealing angel as he is throughout the Bible. He tells us in Daniel 11, verse 2, And now will I show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. Daniel 11, verse 2. History tells us that there, those three kings after Cyrus the Persian were Cambyses, his son, Smyrtus, and Darius, his tapses. The fourth king was Xerxes. Gabriel says that Xerxes shall be far richer than they all. This was decidedly true. He was rich along the lines of Solomon, though not quite as rich, and led a failed military campaign against Greece, though his fighting force was huge along the lines of modern China's. 
It just wasn't God's will, so the venture failed, and historical accuracy is again proven for the prophecy. Next we have this in verses 3 and 4. Very important passage. And a mighty king shall stand up, that shall rule with great dominion, and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken, and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven, and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up, even for others besides those. Daniel 11, verses 3 and 4. It isn't hard to figure out who and what this is talking about. We discussed it last week in Daniel 8. The mighty king is once again Alexander the Great. And once again also, we are told that his empire was to be broken up into four parts and not to his posterity, his family heirs, but for others. As we know, it went to four of his generals after a period of struggle, Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. History once again confirms all of this. In verses 5 and 6, we begin the long succession of nations and events under the terms King of the South and King of the North. It is important here to understand what territories were thus described, not nations. For though the national names and alliances would change throughout the long centuries, the compass directions and the land occupied did not. And that is what is important for identification purposes. This is the only way to determine the antagonists in succeeding years. That is, the occupiers of those territories and their expansions in their stated direction. Another factor that must be remembered is that these directions of the compass range outward from Palestine. So, to begin with, the territory to the north finally resolved as Syria after much battle and consolidation early on, while that to the south was always simply Egypt. Those are the names that the two kings of the north and south began with. Now, let's jump to verse 14. And in th those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also, the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. Daniel 11, 14. The robbers, or breakers, of Daniel's people, the Jews, and into our time, the true commandment-keeping Christians, are the Romans. This is where the mighty Roman Empire first appears in the prophecies, after a few cryptic comments by Moses in the Pentateuch and, of course, its successor, the Roman Catholic Church, and the nation supporting her unto the second coming of Christ. It also must be noted that virtually the entire world today models its government and its parliamentary bodies after that of the Roman Empire. Rome's influence has been and is like none other. She still lives on in this sense. Another jump to the time just before the first coming of Christ into the world. Verse 19, Then he shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. Daniel 11, verse 19. From the preceding verses and the outworking of history, we find that he, in this verse, refers to Julius Caesar, who returned from battle to his own land, a great hero and a great dictator, at the end of the Roman Republic, before the empire but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. This refers to his assassination on the Ides of March, B.C. 44, in the Senate chamber by multiple stab wounds administered by Cassius, Brutus, and many others. He had 23 wounds in all. That's guaranteed to kill. Next, verse 20. Then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom, but within few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. Daniel 11:20. Julius' nephew, Augustus, succeeded his uncle. It was he uh, that was a raiser of taxes. This is the one spoken of by Luke in his gospel. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea, under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. 
And so it was that, while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Luke 21, verses 1 to 7. We now have come to the time of Christ in Daniel's narrative. Augustus was, overall, though oppressive with his taxations, a decent ruler. His age was called the Augustan Age, the glory of the kingdom. But next we have verse 21. And in his, that is Augustus' estate, that is in place of Augustus, shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Daniel 11, verse 21. The man who succeeded Augustus was Tiberius, a person Augustus himself early referred to as too vile to wear the purple of Rome. And the people didn't respect him either. Neither did they give him the honor of the kingdom. So he obtained it by stealth and stratagem, flatteries. We can see here how exact God's prophecies are so that we can make no mistake in identifying the personages and events. It was this man under whom Christ lived and died. Verse 22, And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown, that is, overthrown, from before him, and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. Daniel 11, verse 22. A dual overthrow, swept, washed away, rinsed off, is in view here one after the manner of the sins of the world, Tiberius, and one for the sins of the world, Christ. The first to happen was Jesus' death on Calvary's cross for our sins in the spring of 31 AD. Thus, along with his resurrection, ascension, and his work in the heavenly sanctuary subsequently, absolutely guarantees the eternal salvation of all who truly come unto God by him, Hebrews 7.25. Our sins are washed away, Yes, Christ Jesus, the Prince of God's covenant, died for your sins and mine, for everyone's. It was truly for the sins of the world. But Emperor Tiberius was just the, had just the opposite kind of death, an ignominious one. Six years to the month after Christ died, six is man's number, remember, he was smothered by pillows as he lay ill. This was truly after the sins of this murderous, satanic world. It's what they do. Tiberius himself and all his vileness was thus swept away. Two important lessons learned, I hope. We can make a choice to be like either one. I choose Jesus. Now another time jump to verse 30. For the ships of Kittim shall come against them. Therefore he shall be grieved in return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. Daniel 11 and verse 30. Here the fierce battles that overthrew Rome are brought to view. The barbarian invasion and their main opponent is the papacy as it grew in power. By this time, the 4th and 5th centuries, the nascent Catholic Church had put together the doctrine of the Trinity at the behest of Constantine, through whom also the Sabbath was changed. Three of the barbarian tribes were Arian, that is, they believed that Christ was created, and this enraged Rome to destroy them. Those tribes had indignation against the Holy Covenant, as Rome thought, as if they didn't have the same indignation. But the papacy won. The three tribes were frightfully destroyed, and the Pope was exalted to the throne in 538 A.D., beginning the 1260 years of the first papal supremacy, which brings us to... Verse 31, an arm shall stand on his part, they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and they shall take away the daily. Sacrifice is not in the Hebrew, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Daniel 11, verse 31. Keep in mind here that the word sacrifice is in italics because it is not in the text, being a supplied word. They shall take away the daily is accurate on its own. It doesn't really need a supplied word, although religion would be much more accurate. We shall see presently what it is describing. So as the papacy grew, it received arms, the help of national armies. This began in this period and continues to this day, though there are no hostilities at the moment. 
They are growing apostate doctrines, that is the papacy, especially the priesthood and transubstantiation, polluted the sanctuary of strength for sure, the true heavenly religion of Christ as high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. His daily ministry there was removed from the people's attention. And they also took away the pagan religion of Rome, the earthly daily religion of the empire as well. So he took away both. Their goal, and that of Saint and their leader, was to put all of the attention on Catholicism, not Christ. The devil has succeeded beyond anybody's wildest dreams, temporarily. Verse 32, And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Daniel 1132. Ever since these days when the papacy grew into power, she has always corrupted and flattered those who were and are partial to her. But there were also people that do know their God, who speak the truth and fight against her assumptions. Among them were groups like the Wallensees. Verse 33, And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil, Many days, Daniel 11.33. So during the 1260 years of papal supremacy, God's true saints labored and many died by the wrath of ecclesiastical Rome, Babylon the Great. This includes the Protestant reformers who labored toward the close of this period. Verses 34 and 35. Now, when they shall fall, they shall be holpen with a little help. But many shall cleave to them by flatteries, and some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. Daniel 11, verses 34 and 35. As Protestantism took hold, nations like Germany took the Protestant side against the papacy and protected the reformers and their people. Many fell, some were persecuted unto true holiness, right to the time of the end. Expositors are pretty much agreed on all of the proceeding, but now we come to the point of which there is some contention as to what power exactly is being spoken of in the following verses to the end of the chapter. I will try to explain both positions as we go along, those of Uriah Smith and James White, and then give you the possible solution. Again, if both have some merit, which I believe they do. Please note also that at times, the views seem to overlap a bit, thus almost creating a third view, at least in the type antitype portions. This is because everything is not quite clear to us yet in this section of Daniel 11. And this is another reason we must stay away from absolute dogmatism. Verse 36, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. Daniel 11, verse 36. And the king. In the Hebrew, the word king appears in the lexicon with a, preceding it, not the. This is where the contention starts. Most expositors think the should be there, thus strongly suggesting a singular power, namely the popes. And they argue strongly not only for the papacy, but for the word the. Others see it as a king, any power, something that can only be discerned by the onflow of history, not strongly anticipated as is the papacy, which so is so clearly presented and expected in biblical prophecy. But the onflow of history does supply a power other than the papacy, though the papacy seems very strong here too. This is the problem. Both views seem to fit well. The other power is atheistic politics, which the French Revolution was all about at that time. This is yet another view that you, uh, uh, that you have here uh, from time to time, other than strictly Turkey or the popes. I think the time element in history has something to do with this, by the way, in any case, they say that the French directory government did indeed magnify itself above every god, speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and that its philosophy shall prosper till all is accomplished and done. And that has and is going on. 
Just look at the history of its stepchild, atheistic communism, all the way to the Marxist resurgence around the world, and especially in the United States as we speak. Atheists, infidels, sexual miscreants, wokesters, and all the rest are having a field day with their woke politics, dictums, revolutions, and threats towards the rest of us. This is something, too, that Ellen White predicted for the end of the world, that the French Revolution would go worldwide. It sure has, even now, touching our land of freedom in the United States. But all of this can fit the Roman Catholic Church as well. Just make the he's and him's the papacy instead of France, and then look at this perspective of history also. Verse 37, Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. Daniel 11:37. Here's how both versions look right here. Smith, the French atheist did not regard the God of his fathers, the God of Catholicism, the Trinity, nor the desire of women, Christ, nor any God, but magnifies only himself, that is, atheism. Just listen to someone like Richard Dawkins today. White, as for the popes, they did not regard a God of their fathers, Jehovah, the God of the Jews, the Pope's spiritual fathers, nor Christ, because they teach the Trinity and the unbiblical unbegottenism of Christ, and the popes magnify themselves above all gods, even claiming to be God on earth. I think you can see that this verse can go both ways, and we will see why that is true shortly. Now, verses 38 and 39. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain. Daniel 11, verses 38 and 39. The atheist certainly honored the God of forces, that is, military might, instead of the true God. But so does the papacy. She always has the armies of nations back her up with their armies. Threaten them with eternal hellfire, and the leaders will jump to her aid very quickly. As for the God whom his fathers knew not, the French revolutionaries made themselves a goddess of reason, a naked woman who was escorted into the National Convention of France and was worshipped. Thence she was conveyed to the Notre Dame Cathedral, placed on the high altar, and worshipped as deity. For the papists, on the other hand, that unknown God is the Trinity, not known by his fathers, the Jews. Remember, Christianity comes out of Judaism. But Trinitarians, of course, will say that this God is Mary. The point is, the false God is honored with all gold and silver and precious stones, emblems of Catholicism, Revelation 17.4, as was the dissolute woman in Paris during the French Revolution. And both the atheists and the papists have ruled over many and have divided the land for gain. That would be the entire planet Earth right up to today. Both communists and Catholics have done this. The communists have taken over entire continents during their history, and the Catholics have divided up the entire planet into dioceses and archdioceses. You see how parallel these two views are? I think Smith and White both saw two different yet complementary facets of the one full diamond of truth. Now we come to the last six verses, 40 to 45. Both views see at least some of this as fulfilled. Verse 40. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. Daniel 11.40 And at the time of the end would be 1798. Both interpretations agree to this, but things differ from there. The king of the south is still Egypt, but the territory of the old and shifting king of the north is now comprehended as Turkey. Such is the one view, Smith. The other view sees the king of the south, Egypt, as having a spiritual understanding, Sodom and Egypt, and the king of the north likewise, thus being the papacy. And that's not hard to figure out why, since we are under Christianity today, which is a very spiritual religion. We're not just talking about physical things, but spirituality comes into this. Babylon is also a bit north and east from Israel, as White would say. 
and we know how Babylon is emblematic of the papacy, hence his view. Now in the first view, Uriah Smith's, Bonaparte of France attacked Egypt. So he did. Next, Egypt, the king of the south, then pushed at him, Bonaparte. Then the Turks, the king of the north, got involved and also attacked Napoleon. Three powers are involved in this view. Then Turkey entered into many countries and passed over them, including Palestine, as we see in the next verse, verse 41. He shall enter also into the glorious land, Israel, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. Daniel chapter 11, verse 41. Turkey enters Palestine, but the Jordanian Arabs escape. And then, to accentuate the king of the north's victory, Turkey, we have this in verses 42 and 43. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. Daniel 11, 42 and 43. With all this fulfilled in their view, there is a long break. Meanwhile, the view that says the papacy is the king of the north goes something like this from verse 40. The king of the south, here atheistic, communistic, and Islamic nations in alliance, push at him, the king of the north. The papacy and his western alliance of nations, including the United States, the NATO alliance. These countries are the whirlwind, etc., as they enter the countries of the Middle East and overflow them. Then we see in verse 41 that this includes modern Israel. Egypt will not escape either, verses 42 and 43, as the west takes full control of the financial system and its bounties. Africa is then at her feet. The Turkey view says everything to this point is fulfilled. The papal view says we are still in verse 40 in the space between and many ships and he shall enter. This pause is thought to refer to the time since Reagan and Gorbachev brought down communism in Poland with all the equipment the Americans sent in to uphold Lechwilensis' labor union and bring down the Marxist government with the result that the Iron Curtain fell in 1991. We are now in a holding pattern until everything else in the chapter plays out, they say. Then the two final verses that all agree are not fulfilled in any sense yet, verses 44 and 45. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away money. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Daniel 11 verses 44 and 45. Those who follow Uriah Smith's view that the king of the north is Turkey see him being troubled in the future as in the past when he descends again, this time into modern Israel, where he plants his headquarters to wreak destruction never before seen. Here he meets his end while endeavoring to bring his part in the prophecy to complete fulfillment. Whether by the NATO nations or by Christ's return he is destroyed is not made clear. Those who follow James White's view that the king of the north is the papacy, the north, Babylon, see these two verses as teaching that the papacy is troubled at the tidings that the Asian nations, the east, most notably China, are advancing on the Middle East and that the second coming of Christ is really close now. They usually see this as the physical manifestation of the battle of Armageddon. The spiritual side of Armageddon remember, is the battle for our minds, and that affects all of us. Thankfully, none of the identities of the physical actors are salvific at this point, as all we can do is watch and pray to see how it really shapes up in the future. Because of the noted possibilities for a dual fulfillment in these verses, a type-antitype kind of relationship, and the time periods involved, I think it is very possible that both views, advanced by the two premier pioneers, White and Smith, may be true to some degree. Yes, type-antitype, perhaps. Ellen White never settled the issue, so it is still an open book. Let us be kind to each other in the meantime as we, regret, as we get ready for that which we know for certain is coming. And that is quite enough on our plate for right now. 
We must be thoroughly sanctified for one thing. The Sunday law agitation will have been going on right up to this point, remember. The loud cry warning will be given, Revelation 18, 1-5, and probation will close as this final battle begins. We must be like Christ. He did not sin, even by a thought. We must possess our souls. So that's a big issue for all of us to be concerned about right now, I'd say. I know I have a ways to go on that front, and if you're honest, so do you. At this point, what I see is Turkey invading Israel, the type, and is immediately attacked by the papacy NATO, the anti-type. Then the Russians, China, and what is left of the Muslims and atheists march to Israel to destroy the papal West. But Christ returns and destroys them all, hauling the physical Armageddon. I believe all of this takes place in the last 15 days of our current sinful history, Revelation 17, 12 to 14 one hour in day for a year apocalyptic prophecy. If you would like much more information and thoughts on this possible type anti-type scenario, please go back on my Facebook timeline to January 15th and 22nd, 2020, for my discussion then of the Eastern question, Wednesday's Prophecy Studies number 338 and 339, How Does the End Come, Parts 2 and 3. There is much more detail on those articles in here. My view has matured some since then, as our views should constantly evolve as unfulfilled prophecy becomes clear with time, as does our knowledge of the total picture. And to that point, let us all remember what Elder James White said about unfulfilled prophecy, which we speak of. Fulfilled prophecy may be understood by the Bible student. Prophecy is history in advance. He can compare history with prophecy and find a complete fit as the glove to the hand, it having been made for it. But an exposition of unfulfilled prophecy where the history is not written, the student should put forth his propositions with not too much positiveness, lest he find himself straying in the field of fancy. Positions taken upon the Eastern question are based upon prophecies which have not yet their fulfillment. Here we should tread lightly and take positions carefully, lest we be found removing the landmarks fully established in the Advent movement. Elder James White in Review and Herald, November 29, 1877. These are wonderful words to remember and live by. Where the history is not written nor confirmed by Ellen White in her writings, this includes my ideas of a type any type fulfillment, which to me makes great sense, given the global situation that has been developing since World War II, and it isn't going away. But we are all definitely in a holding pattern while we await the final movements and the return of our Lord. Watch and pray, and don't be so dogmatic on things like this. Thank you for your interest and time. I hope this has been enlightening. Jesus is coming soon. Maranatha.